why did I do DPC? I did DPC because there are so many people who are underserved in primary care in our country. Literally every person who has a primary care doctor in our country is not well served. So I wanted to fix that. I wanted to create a clinic where both the patients are well served, they get the service that they expect and want and deserve, and a clinic where I can also enjoy the profession that I chose and get back to the real root reasons of why I chose the profession of being a physician and specifically a family practice. That is a relationship-driven thing, and it's a relationship with my patients, and I just wanted to create a practice where I could make that relationship the priority in the clinic. Since I started DPC, I really developed a heart for the self-employed people of the United States, the laborers, the people who are caught in the Medicaid gap, who make just a little bit too much for Medicaid, people who are contractors, people who work for small nonprofits, all the people who are not given on a silver platter some awesome insurance. And so those are my people now that make up half of my practice. And I love serving that population of our country. I am Dr. Jamie Glover of Glover Family Medicine, and this is my DPC story. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Glover. Thank you. So glad to be here. So you are another person I had the awesome privilege of meeting last year at Hint Summit. And so it is so wonderful to talk with you and to get your story on the airwaves for the whole audience to hear. So I wanted to start with a quote that you have on your website. And that quote is, I tried to introduce students to primary care as it was meant to be relationship-based, not production-based. I hope to show students and residents that there are alternatives to assembly line medicine. And so just in alignment with that statement and your opening statement, I want to step back into your beginnings into primary care and why you chose family medicine as your specialty. I chose family medicine on my rotations as a young Air Force officer rotating at Eglin Air Force Base. And it just clicked with me. I'm a people person. I'm a relationship person. I... I love the added complexity of what patients bring to their physical problems, like that whole overlay of whatever it might be, anxiety or stress. It actually makes patients interesting to me because if I saw just head colds all day without something added into that, it wouldn't be that fun for me. So I do love human interaction. I love the challenge of just dealing with the broad spectrum of the population. So family medicine just fit with me, but it takes time to develop relationships and to deal with those other layers that come into the doctor patient relationship that come into the exam room that come into the clinical encounter and i chose family medicine i'm so happy that i did but at the same time in the air force great environment wonderful residency but what would happen is um, you might have a panel of patients and then maybe your buddy would get deployed so you would have their panel too so you would have a double panel And it was very difficult to take care of those people in the way I wanted to. And I was faculty in a family medicine residence program. And I taught residents as well as had rotating medical students from the Uniform Services University, as well as other Air Force medical students from other medical schools around the country. And so it got to be hard to teach them family medicine to say, this is what it should be, but it really isn't. And I felt guilty recruiting people into my beautiful specialty and maybe even feel like I was lying to them about the way it was out there, that it was the way it was supposed to be, but it really wasn't. Then I got out into the civilian world. I had a very varied practice. I got to see so many different things. I got to see prison medicine, low-income medicine, HIV medicine. I got to work in a private practice that got acquired by a big health system. I did rural temp work. I did so many different things that I got a really great perspective on the whole medical system and how we should treat our patients and how we should train the next generation of physicians. And so I said, the only way I can do this, I heard about DBC from Clint Flanagan of Nextera giving a speech once at the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians. And I said, I have to do this. And I scared myself when I said that, because I knew I wasn't lying to myself. I was like, I'm going to do this. And when I did do that, I knew I wanted to help train the next generation, just as I had been faculty in the Air Force. And so I went to CU, University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I volunteered to teach medical students in my practice, third-year students, now also second-year students. And I wanted to train them in an environment that shows them that family medicine is like a legitimate choice, a beautiful specialty, and something that they can do. And I feel like I've been really successful in that because my first 
med student that ever rotated with me in that program, he wanted to do either neurology or neurosurgery, probably neurosurgery. But when he left my rotation, now he did go neurosurgery and I'm so proud of him, but he was like, you almost made an internal medicine doc out of me. I almost made a primary care doc out of him. And I'm not going for wins in that, but I just want to show that generation that you can do things the right way. There is a way to do it right, to have a relationship, non-production driven practice. And, and then practice can be fun and beautiful. You can actually doctor people the way doctoring is meant to be. So cool. And your journey in particular has so many different aspects to it compared to most people who go to undergrad and then go to medical school and then go to residency because you've been in the Air Force, because you've been in the clinics and the settings that you mentioned. When you look back on your experience and you talk to medical students nowadays, do you have any recommendations for those people who are dipping their toes into relationship-based primary care in different settings in terms of rotations that they should look into or scholarships or any opportunities that would give a really good primer to relationship-based primary care, in, including DPC clinics? I think at the level I teach, which is medical students, now I would love to teach in a residency, but we do not have an MD residency in the town of Colorado Springs right now. There is a DO residency. I don't have a relationship with them yet, and I would love to have a relationship with them. I'm an MD, but I think we can all train each other. We can all learn so much from each other. But I do think when I can teach residents, I strongly would recommend residents consider a practice management rotation, one or two of them in their residency. And that one of them be with some sort of alternative practice model like DPC, which hopefully won't remain alternative for long, which will become mainstream over the years. But anyway, so I definitely think they should do that. I can't say that I have any knowledge of scholarships and stuff like that. Do you have anything like that? So just given that the listeners are tuning in from all over the country and in all over the world, what I would say is take the idea of I would like to find a scholarship and start Googling, asking local DPC doctors because there's so many random scholarships. Like, for example, the Seroptimus Club in our town locally is giving female college students like $500 towards education as long as they're enrolled in college. And so it's like little things like that, $500 here, there, it adds up. That's how I got through a third of my UC Davis tuition fees. And so I definitely would say I'm in the same boat. I don't have any particular scholarships, but I would say that's where I would start in terms of investigating, is there a scholarship? And if you're not yet at the level of getting a particular scholarship, like if you're a medical student and you're looking at a residency scholarship later, on and you see the criteria that one needs to later apply for that scholarship, those are certain things that you could work towards now. You know, like if somebody did want to go into primary care, there's lots of pro-primary care opportunities. You jog my memory. So our Colorado Academy of Family Physicians is very pro-DPC. And in fact, when we put our legislation to our state Congress back in 2017 to protect DPC as the primary care model that it is and not insurance, they helped us organize that. And our organized effort just made it a beautiful process. Everyone at our state capitol recognized it as a nonpartisan issue, that DPC is a safety net for many people. And it was the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians who helped us organize that effort, all as DPC docs. And so they give a scholarship to the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians Conference every year. And there are always DPC docs at that too. And sometimes DPC lectures, that's where I first heard about DPC from Clint Flanagan. And I think it was 2015 or 14, even when I said, I'm going to do this. So there's that scholarship to go to a conference. And then there's also, of course, Hint, my billing company is Hint. And we all choose our various softwares and things like that. And there's pluses and minuses to all of them, but I just love Hint, the company so much. And they're much more than just billing software, they're practice management and so much more visionary. I would never leave them, but they offer scholarships to their Hint conference, which isn't so much going to get you like continuing medical education, but it's going to get you excited about the possibilities and thinking outside the box and what could be done in DPC and beyond. So there's that hint scholarship too, that I think people should know about, or next era, I think paid for some students to go to the hint thing too. I don't know if they exactly called it a scholarship, but the point is there's people who are willing to help students get experiences that will help them shape their future. 
I love that. And for any listener who is interested in finding out more about the conferences, if you go to the mydpcstory.com resources page, there's links to the main conferences, the Hint Summit, the AAFP co-sponsored DPC Summit, as well as the Nuts and Bolts Conference. And, I, and you can look for updated information about the comfort, the upcoming conferences, as well as if there are scholarship opportunities, because like you mentioned, the AFP co-sponsored summit that is co-sponsored with the DBC Alliance, as well as the American College of Osteopathic Family Medicine, as well as the Family Medicine Education Consortium, they typically offer a significantly discounted rate for medical students and residents and if you are working with a local DPC, whether that be a micro practitioner or a larger company, you can ask if even that DPC offers scholarships in particular, because I've seen that on the Facebook groups before that individual DPC doctors will bring a medical student or resident with them. The Hint Conference was in Denver this year. And so I had a medical student and he worked with me on Fridays and I was going to be at the Hank conference on Friday. And I said, Hey, do you want to talk to your preceptor? And I, I could bring you along one or two days. You can come both days. You can get out of something else or just one day or whatever. Yeah, it's true. Like I think DPC doctors, we're excited about what we do and we want to share it. That's so true. And now going back to you mentioning in 2015, you heard Dr. Clint Flanagan talk about DPC when you heard him talk about DPC and then fast forwarding to your journey into DPC, what did the next steps look like? Because before opening Glover Family Medicine, you were a physician at Peak Med. It turns out, I think it was 2014 that he spoke. And I was literally so excited because I was like, this will allow me to practice primary care the right way. And this will be good for me. And this will be good for my patients. It will be good for teaching. So I literally went home from that conference. It ended on a Sunday, you know, at noon and I Googled DPC in my town. I came across some stuff and I kind of researched that. And somewhere along the way, I stumbled across Mark Thomas Sulo and Peak Med who were going to be opening, so this is 2014, sometime within maybe the next year. I don't think he had actually opened yet. So I literally just called him. I was so excited. I stalked his info somehow and called him. But simultaneously, very soon after that, I also was researching what are DPC conferences I might be able to go to. Do these things exist? And I found one that I signed up for the summer of 2015. But meanwhile, Mark did get back to me. I met him at a local coffee shop and he told me his vision. It was small at first, which great, small or big, whatever you want to do. And we made a tentative plan that I might be his first doctor. He had started the DPC to work in it himself, but he did get the eye of some investors and things. And they started thinking more about employer groups, which is great because we need to rescue the employers of our country from this terrible situation, the tapeworm that I think, you know, is eating up all of their revenue basically. And that's providing healthcare for their employees. So I mean, we do need to rescue them too as DPC, but Mark was starting to go more in toward that space before he had even actually started working in his DBC. And so he was looking for another doctor to actually start in the DBC. Now I had some various things happen in my life. The clinic where I was working, the doctor got cancer. I was the only doc left in the clinic while he was getting treatment. He did survive, but it was harsh treatment. And there was a bunch of PAs in that clinic too. And I really felt a responsibility to stay there for an extra year to help that clinic survive. So in the end, I did not become Mark's first doctor. Eric Hetzel did. He's a great guy. He's my friend. We worked together at Peak Med. I did become the second doctor at Peak Med. So I was in on the early days. But meanwhile, I was also going to these conferences. I went to a Pamela Weibel Live Your Dream conference too. That was a little bit more outside of the realm of DPC, but direct care proponent in a different kind of way, maybe not in a monthly membership kind of way, but in the whole, let's get back to relationship-based medicine kind of way. And um, so, you know, I start volunteering at Peak Med one day a week, just gave it to him for free, quit the clinic where I was working. Once it, my doctor got better, it transferred hands to the big health system. They let me be a contractor for a year. I would not sign the employment agreement. I read about our views. I was like, nope, I'm not signing that. Did a bunch of temp work, started volunteering at Peak Med. And then started working at Peak Med, I think it was January of 2016. And they, because they went for employer groups, were able to give me a big panel right away, pretty big, like at least maybe 350 patients from like a credit, a local credit union who had signed up their people to be taken care of by Peak Med. So I pretty much within maybe two months, I was already up above 
maybe 550 patients. And within a few more months after that, I think I had a panel of, it was 700 to 750 patients. That's a unique situation and great, but I should have known that I always had it in me to do my own thing. Because if you're like the kind of person who's looking for conferences and signing up for them and going to them yourselves and those kinds of things, it probably just means you want to be your own boss. And I realized that pretty soon in, I'm like, I just want to do it my way. I want it to be my dream and my goals. And I'm not against the employer group thing at all. And I am in this town with Peak Med and we are friends and I support them. I closed my panel at one point for 11 months because I was too busy and we referred people down the street to Peak Med. But if you're that person that's like really active on DPC Docs Facebook page, DPC Women, go into your own conferences, you probably just want to be your own boss. <laughs> so just do it from the beginning. And that was my journey. And I, I did have to opt real quick back into Medicare and as I had opted out. But in order to do my own DPC, I needed to do some a little temp work in the in-between and while I started. So I opted in on, at that time, day 88. I don't know if it's the same anymore. And then I was able to go do some temp work and open my own DPC. I moved more than 15 miles away from Peak Med. I was not doing that to be a competitor. I was doing that because that was my destiny. For those people who are on the fence and looking at potentially bridging their hesitancy with an employed position, what are some other words that you could share with them in terms of negotiations or in terms of how to advocate for yourself, if that's possible in a contract, to control the rate of growth on a panel, for example? Okay, so first off, when I was coming together to talk about that contract, there was a 30-mile non-compete clause in there. I was traveling into Colorado Springs, down in some altitude, and like maybe 25, 30 minutes away from my home to work at this particular clinic that I was signing on to. If things didn't work out, I wanted to be able to have a clinic in my very own town, which is Monument, Colorado, the Tri Lakes area. It's it's close to Colorado Springs, but it's a distinct entity because we are on a divide and we have like a mountain foothills type of climate. So people don't like to go from here down into the Springs and they don't like to go from the Springs up to Monument. It has its own little feel. And I'm like, that's actually where I'm, where I live. And so I was like, I don't, I'm not going to do this job. I wouldn't have even signed it. If that compete is going to stay 30 miles, it needs to be 50 miles or less, because if this isn't the right thing for me to potentially do for the rest of my life, then I need to be able to go where I'm from and do my own thing, whatever that looks like. That was just like how I really felt about it. And so when we were signing the contract, I think people can tell when you're literally not going to sign the contract over that thing. <laughs> and I wouldn't have. And so that was I negotiated because it was like a true sticking point for me. But it was there was no animosity or anything. He agreed to it. So he just asked. <laughs> so there was that. Then as far as panel growth, it's complicated because... I was really scared at the beginning to get so many patients at once to get like 350 and then 500, 550 just within a couple months. But it's really different when you get a dump of employer group patients on you than when you have individual patients and families signing up for you, usually at that moment for a very specific reason because they need you. And so they definitely come in for their new patient visits. Whereas when you get in a, say I had 350 employees roughly from one employer put into my panel, half of them weren't even in the room getting the briefing from the HR person because they're the spouse of someone who works there. They don't even know what benefit they have. The other half that were in the room getting the briefing, they don't even really care. They're young. They don't care whatever their benefits are until they need them. And actually, when you get in a dump of employer visits all at once, you don't necessarily get overwhelmed with new patient visits. And in fact, I learned I had to call both parties, like both adults in the household, if there were two adults, to explain, hey, through your spouse's employer, <laughs> you have this benefit. And we would make sure to not only call the employee, but the spouse, because, and if you want to take advantage of it, <laughs> this is what it is. And this is how you contact us. And we'd love to see you for a new patient visit and all of that. If I could talk to them in person, great. But a lot of times you get voicemails. So I had to create a script. And then when I was comparing my panel at the time to the other doctor who was there, there was a point where my panel actually got bigger, but is it just based on numbers? Like how busy is your panel? Because that doctor had a panel who had grown initially more by individuals and families and then their first smaller employer employees, which Peak Med was very aggressive about going out and seeking and did a great job getting lots of little small employers and then medium one. And then what I call big, like maybe a company with 750 at the time. I don't know what they're going for now, but that's big to me. That panel like looked different than mine, which started with a big employer group. And so 
it's hard to say whose panel is busier. Is it the one with the more numbers or is it the one that has more individuals and families who sign themselves up and are more engaged? So it's pretty complicated, I learned. And it gave me a little bit of not a fear, but it would be complicated bringing someone into DPC and being their employer and explaining that to them because probably it's hard to compare panels. That's all I can say. I think those are extremely helpful points to make. And I think that it really highlights that at the end of the day, just like how you talked about seeking a practice management rotation for those people who have the ability to find and rotate in one. This is the type of practice management question that people should be asking because it's it's like how you hear some people saying, oh, I have 50 people, but each of those 50 has seven hours every three months that I care for them versus a person who takes care of a patient for four hours over the entire year. So busy does not equal a certain number. And I think that is a really, really good point to make because I think there is a little bit of, oh, this person is how many patients? And yes, it might equate to more patients equals more money, but then that also equates to looking at how much time you spend per patient and potentially raising your prices if you're already open and having a panel where you're giving so much time to each patient. I love that. And I love that you spoke up for yourself when it came to, I I live in Monument. I can't sign a contract that will prevent me from practicing in my area if if that desire ever arose. And so I think that is another great point to mention because if somebody is seeking employment in a direct primary care clinic, you you have to read the contract that's looking out for your basic autonomy. And it has nothing to do with, like you said, animosity or anything. It's just basic. If you're going to be employed, know what your contract says and are you okay with it? So I think those are super sage pieces of advice. I don't think I personally would write a non-compete for another doctor. It's just how I am. When I first moved to Colorado Springs, I worked for a doctor in private practice and he didn't put a non-compete on me. So he had like two page contract and I would have something, but it would be much shorter than what I signed or what I signed for anyone, UC Health or anyone else. And there would be no non-compete. I am confident in my ability to maintain the panel and practice that is right for me. And if someone literally wanted to open up down the road, I don't think they would end up stealing patients from me. Maybe it's something where I invested overhead in them and they, you know, in the end, maybe lose like financially, but I probably as long as we're on good terms, we'll try to somehow partner with them, you know, like, Hey, let's share and back each other up and let's try to have a little handshake agreement that we're not going to overly try to steal each other patients or undercut each other. So. And I think that, that it really is hard to argue that a place is too saturated with DPC. It's true. And yeah. even peak med actually ended up after I opened here, they ended opening one not far down the interstate from me still technically Carter Springs on technically a monument, but if you take the interstate and go down and out to do just a little bit, it might only be 11 minutes away. And I wasn't scared. I wasn't like, oh my gosh, like they're open right there. What's going to happen to me? I wasn't. And what happened? Nothing. And then when I closed, I had a place to briefly do my panel, the send patients to. And then when I reopened, I don't know, it just, it was just fine. It was just fine. You can't be too saturated. Love it. So now going to going into opening Glover Family Medicine, Given that you had been to conferences, given that you had been at a DPC, even though you were an employee, going from that position to opening your own direct primary care practice, how was opening in terms of strategically planning, in terms of your onboarding workflow? How was it for you because you had the experience you did going into opening? I think I already had some ideas about what I wanted. I knew that someday I wanted to grow to have a support staff of at least 2.5 FTE supporting me roughly, just because of what I've seen and the kind of practice I want and the kind of coverage I want to be able to have when I'm on vacation or on off days. And some people start with a micro practice or whatever, but I knew I wanted to get to that. I knew I couldn't start with that. I pretty much had to start as a micro practice, but because I had seen what I'd seen and gone to conferences and also been really freed by Pamela Weibel to just start <laughs> without much preparation, I, I went to an attorney, a banker, and an accountant in one day. And then I made plans that was like August to, I started to rent part of a place, an optometry clinic that had extra space. I just started knocking up clinics, physical therapy, whatever I was going to open in November. So like August to November and just 
have low overhead to start and just do it. I didn't do pre-enrollments or anything though, because I didn't want to give the perception of hurting peak med or anything like that, because I really wasn't trying to hurt them. It just wasn't the right thing for me. I didn't want to do that because then I thought it might pull some of their patients. And I want them to be successful on their own and me on my own in my own community. The thing fell through this rental that I did for November. So I did start at the very end of December out of home office, coffee shop, and those kind of visits. Also, I worked at a hospice at the time and they had like a little extra room so I could do consultations in there too. So I did that from late December through January, February, had to find a new space and renovate that just a little bit from January, February, March, opened in March. So I just like, I say, just start, just be like, okay, I'm just going to start this thing. All I really needed for my home and all those office and the coffee shop and consultation and visits was, and I did have my EMR. So I had hint to sign people up and I had elation. I don't know if I had spruce yet or not. I think I did. I, yeah, I did. I had hint elation spruce. I had my software set up and an entity, which is really easy to do in Colorado. Just like literally sign up for, I think $20 on the secretary of state website or something and an accountant. And I do bookkeeper. I can't remember. I don't think I had her yet, but I got her pretty quick after that. Anyway, so just start. (laughs) And then a few patients from a previous practice came over to me. So I had previously been at North Springs Family Medicine Urgent Care in 2013 to 15, and then dabbled around peak med and other temp work in 15, 16, and then opened in basically January of 2017. And some people just, they just find you. And so at least I had a few patients. By the time I actually opened my physical office, maybe I had 35 or 40 patients for that. And it gave me that practice with the software. And I really didn't have any overhead to speak of, just the payment for the software. And I had put just a little money in at the beginning, no loans. And I survived off that for that whole time, as well as for the first three months after opening. And then all the bills were being paid by the memberships by that point. I never had to take any loans, which is great. But I did put a little money at the beginning. I didn't take a loan for it, but it was savings. Now going into your sixth year, which is amazing. Ah. When you look back on that time going into opening your own practice, are there any things that you would have done differently? You mentioned the things that you did along the way, but were there any parts of your workflow or patient experience or your experience in terms of your daily schedule that you would have done differently? I picked software just based on what I thought, but I did open, my husband was in a career transition phase of his life and he was my helper. And I would say he worked at least half time, like at least 20 hours a week, helping me out and not medical, never been medical admin. And he could only handle so much medical software (laughs) and other new software. And so I had all these visions about how I would use Spruce and everything else. And that didn't happen because the way I would use it is not what he was capable or wanted to do. If you have someone like that in your life who's going to help you, you probably should have input into the workflow. They should have input into the workflows. And I have still never deviated from the way things started. I would love to use Spruce in a more expanded way. But once he was there and then he trained the next person and they trained the next person, we just still use the things the same way that we did when we started because that's just how it happened. And then you get too busy to change. So I would just have anyone that you're going to work with be a part of that and realize how much you actually probably do know about making softwares function together just as a physician, having been on EMRs and stuff for years. I wish that I might have been able to simplify my costs of software if I had talked to Matt and had a few less pieces of software at the beginning. I am really glad I did have a helper though, personally, because it really helped with marketing because a lot of when you're new, it's people calling to find out what you're all about. And while they're doing that, and those can be long phone calls at first. And if I didn't have that, I don't know what I would have done. I'll be honest, because then I'm trying to like, how do I order supplies? I got to create processes. Like if I have them dipping a urine or whatever, like, where am I going to write that down until I get it in the EMR or whatever else? Creating myself little memory jars, flow sheets. I'm really glad I had him. I guess that doesn't answer your question. And you're asking, what would I have done differently? My whole first year, I'm really happy with, I'll be honest, because it was simple and small. I love it. And I think that you really do answer the question in that you're looking back on what was really crucial to 
making your practice successful now almost six years later. So one of the things I want to highlight there is that in you had you had posted your hint growth, your attrition and your growth graph, which is something that you can have as a hint user, something to track your your clinic growth. But you had a hundred members by about nine months in, and then just a little over three years in, you had grown to 120% of your opening number. And so looking back, what comments do you have for the audience in terms of growth and how to control growth? Because you mentioned also that for 11 months, you were on a hiatus from accepting people because you decided that was right for you. Yeah, I think whatever is right for you is not wrong. So you can, I really don't think you can listen to other people about this because you're going to have different services than everyone else. And then how you administer those services are going to be different from everyone else. And so for me, at first, I took unlimited patients, whoever called, that's who I took. And then maybe a year into that, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I I, max four four new ones a week. And then there's a point where I'm like, I can't see this many new people a week and still keep up with my other patients. So that's it. I'm going to two new ones a week. And then finally I was like, I'm too busy. Things happen. COVID happens. You're starting to try to figure out how to give shots, monoclonal antibody, whatever. You're just busy. And so I was like, that's it. I'm not I'm not taking any new patients for a while. And I was nervous. I was like, what if everyone forgets about me and doesn't know what I am anymore? Strangely, it worked the opposite way because I guess supply demand. So the supply of my appointments and new patient visits got very small, like almost zero. You know, I am in charge of my own clinic, so I could have your friends and this and that. You can let a few people in. But for the most part, I said no to everyone. And we referred to the other DPCs in town too. So we were like, hey, here's some other places you could go. Some of those patients were sad just because A, they'd either heard about me, not because they were against the other clinics, but because I'm up here and they're from up here and this I'm who they heard about. And B, just because of location, because they're like, you're right down the street from me. And I'm like, I'm sorry. You just keep, right now we're just not doing this, you know? So anyway, so that worked in my favor to close in a way, because when I opened, there was plenty of demand, even though we didn't even keep a waiting list, actually, because we sent people elsewhere, because I just didn't know how long it was going to be closed, but I'll be honest. And we just didn't want people stagnating on the waiting list. I didn't necessarily have another doctor coming to work for me tomorrow. So we're like, it's a pandemic. Go get yourself a doctor. There's some great ones in town. So when I did reopen, I decided to reopen with just one new unit a week. And that has been great, actually. So that was I don't remember if it was in March that I reopened of this year to taking new patients again. And one new unit means it's either an individual, a couple, or a family. So we just sign up one new unit a week and we try to get them all in for new patient visits. That can happen anytime, but just the signups, like they pre-enroll, but we have to activate the enrollment. We call them when they pre-enroll and say, hey, thanks for pre-enrolling on the website, but we actually have a waiting list. Or if they call us, we say, hey, we do have a waiting list. The funny thing is most people would rather wait on the waiting list than go into Colorado Springs to the other DPCs because either they're from here up here or they they just know me because word of mouth because eventually word of mouth is a really big deal. That's I say control the growth for you. I I find that 450 to 500 is a good number for me and only seeing this one new unit a week is a good amount of new people to see once I was full. At the beginning I could obviously handle a lot more new patients but it just continually changed as my pain will change. And I am, I provide service the way I provide it. I really like to know my patients. I spend a lot of time at the new patient visit. I'll have a second and third one if needed. If I really feel like I know them, they really feel like they know me. They trust me. They actually take my advice. I touch them. I do non like USPSTF indicated physical exams because I feel like touching the patient is part of the culture of the exam. I do breast exams on women. I even do breast exams on 80 year old women because I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do mammogram at that age, but what if they have a fungating mass that nobody's looked at because nobody ever looks at their body? That's just the way I practice medicine. I call people in for their physical exams every year. That may or may not be indicated either for some ages. You might be like, oh, every other year is fine. I do that. Some people might not do that. I don't know what people do. So what I do is right for me and my patients and it's working. So I'm like, Do what's right for you and your patients, cultivate that panel that who it works for and don't look at anything anyone else is doing. And then you have to have a budget. So charge whatever rates make your budget work. So that's the part where I'm a little bit like, is there really much of a distinction sometimes between DPC and concierge? What if you need to charge like $115 for your older population to make your budget work? Or 85, are you a bad person because one's charging more or not? No, you're not. So do look at your budget, practice medicine the right way for you and your patients, and you, you won't be wrong.
I love that. And I hope that it gives some listeners confidence in terms of not only pricing, but also again, busy does not equal a certain number. So <laughs> yeah. So I love that. Now you are an assistant professor at a Colorado at CU School of Medicine. And so when you talked earlier about how you volunteer your time for the medical students there, and you also have students rotating with you, how has that been creating a curriculum or creating experiences for medical students when they go from the classroom learning to learning in your clinic, learning with boots on the ground? I think DBC is just the greatest place to teach students how to really doctor when if you understand what doctoring is it's like really caring for people and you know having their trust and I mean just caring about more than just like their diagnoses and all of that or getting through clinic and so I my goal is for a med student to see only two or three patients in a half day these are mostly third year students and now even some second years but they actually can deal with so many more things in one visit than they could elsewhere. So say somewhere else, you're seeing more volume, but then just dealing with one little thing and maybe not very well, just because time constraints, not because it's anyone's fault versus my clinic where it's like different things come up and I'm like, Hey, we got the time to spend with this patient. So go ahead and do it and learn. I know we came in for this, but we're allowed to do an, oh, by the way, at the wellness visit here. And so take some time going into the vertigo or whatever else that do a hall pipe. The curriculum is really just presents itself, honestly. And then as we go throughout, I mean, I obviously really, I think the biggest part of the curriculum is teaching them about what kind of insurance people do and don't have, because some of the clinics they're rotating in, they don't know because it's a selected population of insured patients. So they don't actually know that these people exist <laughs> that don't have, that have health shares or they're just self-employed and they have nothing or they're deductible is 8,000 because those people don't go into the other clinics. I tell the students, and I love their school, CU, but I even had a patient, a missionary from Afghanistan who's home for a year on a sabbatical, an American citizen who doesn't have insurance because she's a missionary and she's on sabbatical. And she had a very interesting neurological diagnosis that's unusual. And she wanted to see an expert in that before she went back to Afghanistan. And I understood that. And the expert in our state was that. CU and shoots like our medical school. I thought it was like a resource of our state. They didn't take self-pay patients <laughs> and she was willing to pay whatever because she needed that reassurance before going back to a country with limited resources. And so I was like, the medical school clinic, a neurology clinic <laughs> doesn't take self-pay patients. Do you know how many self-pay patients there are in our country? So that is like the curriculum I teach the students. Like, these people exist and this is why. And now there's a whole nother group that I used to take care of when I worked in a big expanded health department. Those are the patients who have, you know, Medicaid basically. And right now I'll admit, and especially in Colorado, that's not my main population. My main population starts at the Medicaid gap. They start with the people who just make a little too much for Medicaid and who's taking care of them. So sometimes people go, don't you feel bad not taking care of the people with Medicaid? I'm like, they have a plan. The people I take care of don't. So I'm glad, like they have the FQHC down the road. And I used to work in a place just like that. And I did take care of those people. And they were my primary population at one point in my career. And now my population is this population that I didn't even really know existed. All these people with no insurance or poor insurance or insurance variants, like health shares that are not really insurance. So that's my main curriculum is teaching these med students about like that. And then also I, part of my curriculum is just teaching them about the culture of touch and why I still do like extensive physical exams, even if the USPSTF says some things aren't indicated by levels of evidence. And then just teaching them like, this is how, I don't know what you're going to do someday, but this is how you can give people good rates on laps. This is how there's this thing called client billing. And what is that? And they're amazed. And here's like a wholesale pharmacy right behind me. And I just refilled my med student was with me this morning. And one of my patients, that's a music teacher who has no insurance. She needed refills of four things. I usually give about six months supply at a time if I can. And I refilled all those eight different medications for $66. And I was like, do you know what this would have cost her? And the medicine had no idea. You know, I'm like, this is how much it saved her. And any doctor, at least in our state, could do this, you know, but they don't really have time to. So you have to have a different kind of practice that allows you the time to do that. That allows you, you know, it's like pain dealing with client billing sometimes for labs. I'll be honest, because I do have the patients with good insurance and my staff has to understand two processes, like 
how we bill, like how to do the patients with insurance and, and then the client bill ones. And it's a little bit fussy sometimes actually, but in this kind of practice, we have time to do that. Other practices, they could actually do that. Like the big box practice down the road could do client billing, but they don't have time for that. That's part of my curriculum is really, it really is practice management. Because I'm just trying to, in the way of try to give them ideas for the future. Think outside the box, wherever you go and whatever you do in your medical career. And one of the amazing aspects of your clinic is that you have a helping hands program. So, you know, when your practice is actively refuting this idea that you are a concierge medicine only for the rich people, can you tell us more about your helping hands program? How did it get created and how is it being used? So it started at the very beginning of the pandemic. We had in March of 2020, a bridge club here in Colorado Springs who got COVID very early and had at least four deaths right off. And I knew a couple of those patients. I saw who they gave it to. So Colorado shut down real fast and Colorado Springs did. And I had immediately a realtor who came to me like within that first month who was having issues, a massage therapist with paying their bills. And I wanted to help them. But I also was like, I got to keep paying my staff. I don't know where COVID is going to go. Is this going to hurt me and my bottom line too, so that I can't even pay my staff? Because by this point I did have a support staff. And so I just, we all just, the employees, I was like, does anyone want to do this? And what should we call it? And, you know, we kind of all talked together and then we all threw in just a little bit of money. And so that we could give it to that first massage therapist, that first realtor who are having trouble with their memberships. And then I just, I told my family, my like extended family, my mom and whatever, my grandma, and they all donated into it. So it started with just employees and my family members and maybe some of theirs. And then we put it out in a newsletter and I don't do regular newsletters. I just do newsletters when I feel like I have something to say. And it's literally as soon as I have something to say, I can fill up two or three pages of stuff. It's so funny. But if I sit there and like pressure myself, like, you got to do a newsletter every so often and have little sections. I don't do well with that. So pretty much if it's, oh, it's time for flu shots, I'll like put that out there. And, and then all of a sudden I, I can think of paragraphs and paragraphs of stuff to say. So in a couple of newsletters, I threw in, hey, we have this helping hands bun and we have a little jar up front and we have cute little hands on it and whatever. And people put money into there. And my patients who are young, like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they are not rich. But some of my patients who are 65 and up, are well enough off that they put like fifties and hundreds in that thing. So that fund stays at like 2,500 to $3,000. And we use it at first just for services that we provided in clinic. If someone would say something like, oh, I'm going to put off these labs because my husband just lost his job. Then we're like, don't worry about it. We'll pay for it with the helping hands fund. And then every now and then we actually do pay for outside services. Like I had a person with diabetes who had neuropathy, who rolled their vehicle onto their leg, their bike, motorbike. And it was not a reliable exam because I was like, I don't think this is fractured, but how can you really tell if someone can't feel, you know, I was like, we really need a foot in an ankle series, but he had just lost his job. And so I said, you know what? I have $120 cash right now. We can get a foot series for 60 bucks and an ankle series for 60 bucks. I know where to get it for that. And we, um, here, just take this $120 and just go to the x-ray place and get it done. Cause he just really needed it done. And then people like that, when he came back and paid us back, he got a job. Eventually he paid us 200 back. So it just has been self-propagating since March of 2020 or April of 2020, when we started it when that first realtor and that first massage therapist got kind of affected by COVID and, and it's maintained ever since. I don't even think I've mentioned it in a newsletter for a long time. And uh, it's still just patients still know about it, put money into it. But every now and then when I do a newsletter, I will say something about how we were able to use it. And we always send a thank you note. I mean, some people just put their change in there and that's like, maybe they bought some medicine and they throw a five, but you know, we try to notice if someone puts like a hundred or 50, send a thank you note. We create a little receipt thing. The thing is, it's not technically a charity. It's a separate bank account. And I'm very transparent with the patients about that because I don't really have the ability in me right now in time to run I don't even know what it's called. Is it called a 501 fee? Whatever a charity is with all everything that's involved. So in my newsletter everywhere, I'm like, this is just a separate bank account with its own number and its own name, but it's not technically like a tax write-off because I just don't have that ability and people don't care. They still donate to it. So it's amazing what, how generous people are. That's all I have to say. 
So cool. And in a world sometimes where we're flooded by overwhelming news and sad news, I think that's an awesome thing to highlight. And for those listeners who are interested, go ahead and check out Dr. Glover's accompanying blog and you can see pictures of her helping hands jar. So thank you so much for sharing about that. Now, in terms of your practice, you've touched on your members, you've touched on the the difference that your practice brings to the eyes of medical students who see how to practice as a family physician who has the time to. And now getting into more of the specifics of how you run your clinic. Two things that I want to touch on. I, I want to touch on one that I really love because it contributes to the culture of your clinic and you have a weekly meeting. What does the weekly meeting look like for you? Do you structure your weekly meetings and has it changed over time? Yes, I do structure my weekly meetings. So I have this, it's a standing agenda just to remind us of what topics to talk about. And if there's one we don't need to talk about, we just skip through it. So it's not like I'm typing up a new thing every time. We just go down and over time, I put things in different orders, added things in, taken things out. So it does change over time, but it is a great structure. So I do have 2.4 FTEs worth of people supporting me. It's one full-time MA. I have two nurses who do a kind of a job share. They each do two days a week. And then I have an admin that's three days a week. So when you add all that up, it's what, four people, two and a half FTEs worth of job. But even when I just had two, my husband, like part-time and my first MA, you need time to just sit around when phone calls aren't happening. People aren't walking in. When I think of something that I want to say to a person, there's feedback you can give in the moment, of course, but you realize, oh, I need to make a point instead of telling that person right then. And it's not maybe the most important thing to say right then, but it's important that we fix some process or something for the future. I type it in a little fake chart. We have in elation and we named the name of the chart weekly meeting. So the first name is weekly and the last name is meeting. And I learned that from Bree Seafelt up in Denver because she has a fake chart named weekly meeting. And I just write a little non-visit note in there. And I write what we need to talk about at the meeting. And so that I can tell all four people at once and vice versa. I give them a chance to, you know, bring things up too. We start like out with passing cards around to sign for patients and business associates and brainstorming about who, because people have heard different things during the course of the week. Oh, we heard so-and-so is getting hip surgery or whatever. So we do that. We, I have my vision and mission on there, especially when I have a new employee, I go over that every week for two months straight. Then it stays printed on there, but I don't always hit it every time or once in a while I randomly feel like I want to hit it. We discuss leave coordination and all of that. We have birthdays and personal celebrations and check-ins and kudos and celebrations of wins to share, which we try to remember, or you plug it into the weekly meeting fake chart so we can remember. Because a lot of times by the time you get there, you're like, I know I had a kudos and I forgot. Status of the practice and any goals. I have that on here to discuss like once a month and we look in hint and we look at our growth and what do we want to be doing? How we're bringing on and confirming new memberships is on here because it's changed over time. So we have to reiterate, remember we were doing this, but now we're closed and now we're reopening, but we're doing it this way. And then we have an OSHA topic presented by my admin person. We have an OSHA binder. And we do a 10 question quiz once a year. And then we just like go through the little sections throughout the year. And because I do have employees and if you have employees, you have to follow OSHA, it's a law. And I always heard, do not get caught with the unopened OSHA binder on the shelf issue. Cause like people buy the $350 OSHA binder or whatever. And then it's just on their shelf and they never do anything with it. And that's not cool if you get inspected. We talk about privacy and privacy law discussions. So just when things come up, like, oh, by the way, like this patient, they got separated from their spouse. And then like, we have to know what if he calls about the kids and she calls about the kids. So we talk about privacy and private, like every time I ask, is there any privacy issues that have come up? And I feel like that's more ongoing privacy law training too and HIPAA. I don't really like the word HIPAA because there's more privacy law than just HIPAA. But anyway, that's our HIP ongoing HIPAA training. We talk about medical supply orders, lab supply orders, and office supply orders because I offloaded those. So I have a nurse who does med supply orders. I have a, another nurse who does the they're both two-day week nurses who does like the orders from Quest Labs, like what blood tubes do we need and throat culture swabs. And then the admin person does like the office supplies, like we need more reams of paper. And there just got to be a point in my life with the amount of patients I have. I just, I don't have time to do that. So I offloaded that to them and they do a great job and we all talk about it. I still order supplies once in a while, but 
the bulk is my nurse, but sometimes it isn't. You're just Googling around and you got to find new stuff. And then we have a no gossip policy on here and a no hostile work or patient environment policy on here. That came from an issue with an employee that I had once. And then also I learned a little bit from Dave Ramsey's Entree Leadership course. And he has a no cost of policy that he recommends. And that is nobody talks negatively about processes or including to patients, clients, or business associates other than to someone who can help try to make a difference which is usually whoever's above you. And also not talking negatively about team members other than to a leader in an inappropriate private setting. It's a small clinic, so we mostly don't have this problem, but I actually did once. I have great people, but once I had a problem, I'm like, all right, it's a policy. And even if I don't read it every time, it's right on there. And then the no hostile work or patient environment policy. And that's also my employee handbook. Of course, no hostile work environment toward people of protected classes, but then also we had someone creating a negative, rude, tense, hostile work environment once for another employee. So I was like, those are fireable offenses. I just leave those on here so everyone knows our culture. But that keeps us organized. And sometimes we have to throw it out the window. Like in the middle of COVID, we were like, oh my gosh, we need to talk about like monoclonal administration process right now. And that's going to take most of the time or whatever. Sometimes you deviate. But I even have it if everyone's not there. If there's only two of us there. It's still a nice protected time to talk. So I highly recommend a weekly communication battle rhythm if you have at least two people in your practice or more. And it's protected because you think, I don't need to have this since it's only me and one other person. I actually think it's good. And we do it at the beginning of an afternoon. It should not be at the end of an afternoon. It will never happen because everything slides downhill at the end of the day or at the beginning of a morning. But I feel like beginning of mornings are busier like, People have called overnight. I don't know. There's So for us, it works beginning of the afternoon before clinic patients start for the afternoon. And that day that I do mine is Wednesdays and I take off Wednesday mornings and then come in and have a meeting. And then I have a very short day of patients after that, just like two and a half hours of patients. So that's my Wednesdays, my half days off a week. And for your meetings, how long are they? It's one hour. So there was a time we purposely made it longer at the beginning, like at COVID. There's just so many things. We were doing car swabs, all of that. So we went to an hour and a half for some time, but then we brought it back down to an hour once we we didn't need that anymore. We always have more to say, but ideally an hour. I think that's enough honestly. And in between meetings, in addition to having weekly meeting as a chart, which I think is a super awesome, helpful tip. Thank um, you, Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have a way of communicating or do you use Spruce to communicate amongst each other for one-off things in between weekly meetings? We have another fake chart called office messages, and that's the name of the person. And so we'll communicate in that. And this came because I don't use Spruce in a very expanded way like some people do. There are other people out there who use Spruce so much differently than me. And that's another thing. When people post about how they use like what they do, you can't even always extrapolate that to yourself because you don't really know how their clinic functions or how they're using tools because tools can be used in so many different ways. And the way I use mine is probably not very much like how other people use Spruce. But we can communicate through there, but usually it starts off with a patient and us communicating about the patient through there a little. We don't have the integration of Spruce with the intuilation actually. So that's why I was like, it might be hard to extrapolate to other clinics, but so yeah, we communicate through office messages, our fake patient emulation. And another detail I want to ask about with your practice, because you've posted about this, is something that I'm sure more than a handful of listeners can relate to. But can you speak to the elusive completed note for your patient? Yeah. So I, of all things, I do still hate writing notes. And I found no matter, and obviously we still have a lot of patient contacts per day. They could be through portal or phone or as well as in person. But I apparently am going to always prioritize writing notes last. And so if there's like, oh, I could find this new like pharmacy label paper right now or finish a note. Then I'm like, oh, I'm going to Google pharmacy label paper, you know, or whatever, anything else. And there are a lot of things to do as a business owner. I realized I have to do notes first because it's the thing I hate the most. And then the longer you don't do them, the longer they take. And then they are the thing that weighs the most on me. It makes me not a good mom at home or not a good wife. 
because this is weighing on and my brain can't get off the fact that they're out there, but then I can't make myself do them at home either. So I was like, all right, that's the thing I have to do. And I listened to some coaching thing. And I so think the nice lady who put it out there and it was free. And just from that one coaching thing, I just started saying, okay, this has got to be first. And I tell myself, I do literally, and I still do. I have to tell myself, you can do this. Like you can do this note. And I'll like literally still want to squirrel away toward anything else. And then I'm like, no, you can do this, Jamie. You can do this note. Jamie, you can do this. <laughs> and then I do it. So I can keep up with my notes. But then I have realized it's harder to keep up with the results. But that is something that doesn't weigh on my mind as much. Now, I do triage results. And this is everything in the queue. It's not just results. Whatever items are in your queue or whatever your EMR calls your queue. But of all the things in the queue, I can... I can handle doing those other ones later. I cannot handle doing my notes later. So I have forced myself to do those first now and it's helped me a lot. And now I'm not behind. So they're almost never not done at the end of the day. And once in a while, maybe the second day, but mostly not. So do those first. It's still hard even in DPC to do your notes. <laughs> but they are shorter and easier notes. No, no review of systems. It's all in the HPI, no coding, but still you doesn't matter if you're DPC or not. You can find plenty of other things to do instead of your notes. So it's, it can still be a problem for some of us. Well, I will say a huge congratulations to, to the fact that you have found a system that works for you to finish your notes and another huge congratulations because you're going on to your sixth year. So thank you so much, Dr. Glover, for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Was, I really appreciate what you're doing, Maria. Next week, look forward to hearing from Dr. Neil Ponchel of Paging Dr. Neil, which serves the New York City metro and New Jersey areas. If you've enjoyed the podcast and you haven't yet done so, subscribe today and share the episode with a physician you may know who needs to hear about DPC. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify now as well, as it helps others to find all these DPC stories. Lastly, be sure to follow us on social media at MyDPCStory. If you're wanting to continue learning more about DPC in the meantime, check out dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception.